Hello people, welcome back to the graphics guide. Today we're going to look at this Tech Graphics Higher Level Section A from 2017. So 2017 short questions. Now question one. So fill in the labels here now again. Just a reminder, there's 15 questions. You have to answer 10, but I would definitely do at least 12 anyway, just in case you make a few mistakes. And if you had time at the end, I'd probably do a few more again. So I would look there for which ones do you know? So definitely anyway, question one there, that comes up a lot there. That's the sector. And concentric. Now concentric means coincident centers. So are the same centers. So these two circles have the same centers, so they're concentric. Now a segment is how we don't eat apple tarts and stuff like that. That's this one. So if you're cutting an apple tart, you'd be cutting it in sectors or poise or whatever. So finally then eccentric is the opposite to concentric so eccentric has a different so the small circle has a different center to the big circle here so that's eccentric eccentric means a bit off or a bit odd or something like that a bit weird so um that's question one now in question two here we've got perspective but it's very important to look at the pictorial over here because there's always information given in that so what i would be taking note of here is to find the top height there of the tunnel you can see there there's an x i could highlight it maybe here with a coloring pencil just to show, oh, just to show what i'm talking about so this X in the pictorial here is giving us the top of that tunnel that's cut into the ice hockey table. So it's very important to notice that. So I'm going to actually start with that seeing as I was talking about it. So that is going from the bottom right hand corner here to the top left. That's a diagonal. And I'm going to do the other diagonal. And that gives us this point here, which is the top height for that tunnel or cutout underneath the table. So that's vanishing back to the vanishing point and coming out this way. So I can now extend up so that's vertical here, that's vertical there. So we had the heights now and I will just heavy in the top of that. And finally, this little leg going back in here, easy to miss that. So you've got to line that up with the vanishing point. So that's going to the vanishing point here, light. And I'll just heavy that bit in there. Okay, so that's that part of it done. Now, the next thing I know then is down from the corner here, like we need to find this corner here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this down vertically and I'm going to find the corresponding point on the ground over here for that. So when I brought that down, that is here. So that needs to be vanished 
back to vanishing point one on the left nice and nice and then I will vanish this edge to vanishing point two and that then finds this corner here okay so that gives us that corner there and this then joins up slopes up there like this okay so that there gives us the end of the hockey table there now the the last problem then is just to complete the cut out on the top so again the top point is vanishing to the right and the far back corner is vanishing so i call it vanishing forward and that gives us the top of the cutout so i'll just heavy that in and because I can see down into this, finally, I'm just going to vanish this forward and heavy it in. And that there is this vertical surface inside here. So that is all of question two. But again, I will just reiterate very important to look here and double check there and again this vertical line coming up there I'll just highlight that vertical line coming up there was another way if you needed to find that back corner there but we had it anyway because and uh, that line was given to us so that there is question two now question three here the figure shows the outline of a logo for a locksmith okay now write down the measurements of a b and c now Now the key to this was noticing there that this is based on a hexagon inside in a circle and it's very important to understand this now that if I just sketch out here a hexagon I'll just sketch out a full hexagon here for a second. So if you have a hexagon there, it's got all six are equilateral triangles. So you needed to know that about a hexagon. So, which means that if this bottom line here is 20, it means every one of these lines is 20, which means that that's 20 there, and this is 20 here. So distance A, the full width of that is 40. And because it's a hexagon, then you would also know that this outside angle here is 60 degrees. And so would the one over here. That's an angle of 60 degrees here. which means that all of this angle inside here then must be 120, 60 and 60 because every angle in this is 60 degrees. They're all equilateral triangles. So angle B there must be 120 degrees. And then finally C. Now we know that the radius here is 15, which means that that's 15 up to there and that's 15 down to here. So that distance there is 30 as far as there and b 
because we know that the radius or the width of this here being 20 and 20. So the radius of that circle is radius 20, which means the height of this here is 20 as well, because if the radius of that circle is 20 there, it's 20 everywhere. So the height of this bit is 20 up to there and 30 up to there. So C must be 20 and 30 is 50. Now question four, uh, I would always recommend counting the boxes here first. So that is five wide here. The front view is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine wide. The height of it is two, three, four, five, six, seven high. Just double check that two, four, five, six, seven high. Okay, so there are main distances there. So because we've got this starting off leg here, I'm just gonna check that they've gone back to full five. One, two, three, four, five, they have. So we know that leg comes in two and up one. In two and up one. So that is the slope here. Then it goes up one, two, three, four vertically. And that brings me to here and here. Now, which way to turn this is is um, an issue here now of sorts, but I'm going to revolve this around. So I'm going to draw it in the way, it doesn't really matter, but I'm going to draw it in the way that shows the shape the easiest. So I'm going to keep the low side to the right. So it goes two, to, it goes two boxes out here in both directions so one two one two so it goes up to then vertically and it goes up one now i'm turning this around so that i can see all of that shape easier but it wouldn't matter if i drew it with the high side to the right so it comes into then down one box just to here and slopes out. Okay. So that's all of the end view done. And I'm going to go through this now just a little bit slower to try and help people to understand it. So I'll just stick a color on the end of this. and just match that into here. So that there now is all of our end view done. So what I would do here now is, I already said there that the full width of this is nine spaces so i'm going to start at the top here two four six eight nine so here's our top surface there now we've got the slope coming next which is now i could go down one and out one or i could just keep following the nine boxes So here's the two boxes out here, then one vertical down, now again I'm just going to stick another colour on this to help people understand the colouring, so that front face there which is vertical it would be over here, that would be there. And a 
I'll just stick a, a bit of red on this there. It's good and bright. So that would be the slope. So this left leg here now just goes up and disappears and the back leg there now that slopes into there so that's going to be sloping in towards here. Towards this dot here. So that's the back part of that leg. I'll just color all that leg in green now. Now, because the whole thing is nine wide, there's a seven spaces in between the legs. So one two three four five six seven spaces so that is like the toe of this so we know it goes back five one two one two three four five and then it's in one two and up one so that's the slope And now it goes vertical until it disappears and it's one thick and that's sloping down this way and again we can also see the inside of that there so I'll just color in this leg here And just to finish it off then. Now you don't need to use so many colors, but I do think so that golden color would be up here. I do think that you can use the coloring to understand what you're doing. And you don't need to color in these views here, but I will because I'm using these questions more to teach people rather than just to rush through them and get them done quickly. Now question five here shows a lampshade and draw a new shade similar to the old one, but with A, B increased to here. Now. When you increase the size of the shape, I'll just do it in a different color here now. So if we make AB this size, now all our angles are going to stay the same. So from B, it's coming down vertical. Now what we've got to do is we've got to enlarge from A. So we're drawing these enlargement lines from A. So again, I'll go through this slowly now and just explain it rather than rushing through it. So we now know that that vertical line goes down to here, which means that the left hand side is the same left hand side is going down to there just add a bit of color to that now when you enlarge it this is a key thing to understand that the bigger size the angles stay the same so what I'm going to do there now is I'm going to go parallel so I'm just setting up my angle and I'm going to use sliding set squares to just 
get that angle going down here and I will do the other side now as well so set up your angle then use parallel sliding set squares that's coming down there and to know where to then we're going to enlarge again from A because A doesn't move so I'm going to enlarge from A out through that corner and that here is the bigger bottom point so I can go along now horizontal here And just to heavy this in then, to make it easier to see it, I'll just go along this outline in green. So again, all the angles must be parallel, but the lengths get bigger. Now question six, now there's a couple of ways I could have done this, but um, a set of triangular flags, now each flag is equilateral. Okay, now that's important. So we know that that's an equilateral triangle there. And it says the length of the sides of each flag reduces in the ratio of three is to two is to one. So if that is three, this is gonna be two and this is one. So I could use that. So I could use that. So if I divided this into three units, then I could take two of them out here and one left for there. Or since I know that this must be two to one, I could just divide this piece here on its own as well. But I'm going to, to go with the three here on this. I just choose to do it that way doesn't really matter when there's two different ways of doing it so I'm going to just step out three equal distances here and I'm going to join the third one to there and go parallel So that's one, two, three. So just grab the compass. So if this is three, I'm going to just measure set my compass to two. And step that out there. And you will find there then that this is the one that's left. And that just fits there perfectly to the end of the line. So that is the first step there. So I've broken this now into three, two, and one. Now because this is equilateral triangles, again, there's two ways I could finish this. And I, I will do the two methods so you can see the two different ways of finishing it. Because it's equilateral, I could set my compass to that. Swing there. Swing here. Because it's equilateral, all those sides must be the same length. So that's using lengths. But the other option that would be available is I could have used angles. And I'll do the small one using angles, just so you can see. So if I was to use angles, I could have just set up here what slope that is. And you can see that's the same. So I could have gone out parallel here and then set up this angle over here the same and gone 
parallel to that. Again, you can see that's the same there. So that's two different ways that I could have done that question. So it just said, find the lengths of the sides of each flag and complete the elevation. It didn't look for coloring. Now question seven here is an auxiliary view in extra elevation, looking in at the angle there to see the true shape of surface S. Now just to help you understand that there, if I was to say that surface S was green, now you're not asked to color on this, but I'm going to just put some colors on it there to help people understand it because auxiliary elevations are a topic that cause people a bit of grief and a bit of mental suffering. So I'll just color in surface S, now that surface S on the 3D here, I'll just link it back to the 3D. Now, this is the key thing to follow here though. The edge view there, surface S is here at this angle. So we are going drawing a view now, looking up. So if I was standing in front of that there, there's my hat and my feet, and I'm looking in at this angle. That's what I see now. So that's the angle of surface S. So you can see the XY line here is set up and all to the correct angle. So what I'm going to do there now is I'm going to project up that is the furthest left side of surface S. Here is the furthest right. And I'm also going to bring up this point here that's on the ground. And I'll just mark that there because that is on the ground. So I could number this and say that's one and two and three and four. Now one and four are both on the ground. So this point two, which is up in the air, I'm gonna grab a compass. Take the height of two. So point two is up here and point four or sorry point three is the highest point on the drawing and three is directly above four so one goes to two two goes to three and three back down to four. And that is the true shape there. And I'll just put that surface in green. So that is the real true shape of surface S. But we're not finished because it's looking for the entire object. So that's the true shape of S. So to finish off the question there now, I've got to find the back points as well. So I'm going to project those up, same angle. Now this is the back point behind point two. And it's at the same height. So that's the inside line for two or and 
I'm just going to bring across there now the height for the top point there, which is three. And I'm going to project that up from here. So that here is three at the front. So that will also be three at the back. That would be two at the back. One, which is on the ground. Is here. So I now have That goes there, two joins the tree at the back. And I can put in here then three to four is vertically down here. And that's a dotted line. And that is all of those done. Now question eight here, we're drawing the recycling bin here now. Again, I'm going to do what's called creating here, where I'm going to draw this as if it was a rectangle uh, with no cut on it. So I'm going to draw it pretty light. So that's my height. Just really going to draw that light there as if it was a rectangle. That's our crease. And we'll deal with the cut then. So we've got a little cut in here about um, maybe a quarter of the ways or something like that. So that is going to give me now that slope coming up to here. And if I was to draw the parallel line there, so that's my slope. Just going to bring that across then, same angle here, parallel. And that's sloping back up to here then. No. So that's the, the, the rough outline of the slope of the bin. Now I'm going to put the cover on this next. So it goes back along here. A little tiny bit out beyond there. It goes up vertically. And parallel going back again. We've got this curve here on that. Goes up vertically here. Heavy them in. Now whatever angle that is. And parallel here. And a little bit of a curve. So that is our top. Now, the final problem here is these wheels. So the center of the wheel is up there. But the problem is I need to offset it a small bit here now because the we're not going to be able to see the inside of the wheel. Now, you could, if you wanted, create in the wheel as well. I'm not sure whether it helps an awful lot. But I'll just run through it and it might. Some people might like that. So, like... That would be the wheel on the inside and I'm bringing it out a little bit. But what you could do there, because it's a freehand sketch, I'm just going to choose there now to heavy that in, give the wheel a thickness.
and it does ask us to cover and shade it so again I'm going to make the body green Just stick a yellow top on this. Finally, if you do have time, if you can find a minute, I'm going to put a ground underneath all that. I'm just looking for a, a different green color, just a different color to put for the ground here. And that's going to do the job for that. So that's some colouring and shading done. Now question 9, some CAD commands. So to get from that to that, you could extrude or push, pull, depending on what CAD package you're using. This would be a fillet. That would be a circle and that would be a linear pattern. Maybe called array as well, it depends on the package. Now question 10, look at the focal points of the ellipse. Okay, so you need to know the focal points, half the major, swung from the end of the minor, so top or bottom, gives you the focal points. So I just mark those in, F and F1, so they are the focal points. So it said locate the focal points and determine the point of contact between the tangent BC and the ellipse. Okay, so they want to know where that tangent is actually touching. Now, there's two ways that we could do this. Now, one way to do it Is I'm going to draw the major circle and because C here is on the center line if I find the tangent from C to that circle it will be straight below it that's one way of doing it so I'm going to just do this like a normal tangent to a semicircle so just open the compass there I'm going to bisect and 
find the middle between the center here and point C. So I'm finding the midpoint here, M for midpoint. So I'm going to draw myself a semicircle. So just sit that there. Here's a semicircle. And this, I, I will draw this in even though that there is the tangent to the circle. So it's going to be straight below that. And that there, P is the point of contact. I'm going to put this in in a color just to highlight it. It's straight below that. Now there is another way I could have done it. I could have done a, a completely different way, an arc through the near focal point, and then swing the major axis from the far focal point and where those two arcs are crossing here I'm going to call that point N and I'll just get red now just to highlight this so if I join that to the far focal point That's another way of finding that point as well. So that's two separate ways of doing it. But I know there's a lot going on there now because of having the two of them on top of each other. Now question 11. Rotate ABCD about point O. Okay, until C reaches the line up here. Okay, so we're opening this set square. So I'll just set the compass there and I will swing up C. But I'm also going to be drawing the arcs here now for B. So B is going to move over in this direction. And D is also going to move up somewhere up there. And finally A is going to move as well. No, A is going to be moving, they're all going to be moving anti-clockwise. All right. So it's just a bit quicker to do it like that. So what do we definitely know? Well, we definitely know that C moves up until it hits there. So that is the new position for C. So even when you open that the distances must stay the same so the distance from c to b when it's open must be the same that's that length here so if c is there that must be b so i can draw that in for starters that gets us up and running Now similarly, the distance from B to A must stay the same. So if B goes to there, A must be here. So I'll just join B to A. Now then the distance from A to D must stay the same. So that's the distance from A to D. So if A goes to here, D, now you can see there now, that's not crossing very well. So that's not a good way to do that really. 
So I can also take it from B. The distance from B to D must stay the same. So the new position for B is here. So that's a better way of finding it. So this here is my new position for D. So I finally joined that back there. Now I could have also taken those distances. I could have also measured the distance from C to D down here and marked from C to D and that would have given it to me as well. So that's our new figure there. A going to B to C to D. Now question 12, this is spatial reasoning or sort of mental gymnastics or being able to picture shapes and move them in your head. Now the one thing I will say there, just looking at this, is that in two of them, it's kind of like a cross in two of them. If you notice what I mean here, I'm just going to colour in a little bit of these here now to help you see what I'm talking about. That is like a plus or a cross or whatever there. Where in two of them, but in this one it's not, they're staggered. So I think B is the one that's staggered is here. So that's B. Where they are staggered. So we've got... B dealt with. We know that that's B. So our next problem now, now mentally I'm taking these and turning this sideways. In my head I'm taking that down here and turning it sideways and I can see there that if I did that the tail as I would call it here is kind of sticking upwards. So that would be A. Whereas if I take this and move it over here the tail is going down the way. So in my mind I'm revolving this, I'm bringing it over and revolving it. So that would be C. So that's the order of that. Now question 13. So it says there, draw the football. Okay, so the tree graphic shows a ball as it strikes the back of the net. And also shown as the in view. So draw the football in position when it strikes the back of the net and rests on the ground. Okay, so that's the key thing, that the ball is on the ground. Okay, because at the moment it's up in the air, but when it's on the ground and up against the back of the net. Now, there's probably two ways of doing this that I can think of, but first of all anyway. If I get the radius of the ball, set my compass to that. So if that ball is, just mark up a height here, the radius height, and I'll just do it again over here anywhere randomly. So if the ball is sitting on the ground, The center of the ball must be that height above the ground. Now, there's two ways now that I can finish this question. I can bisect this angle or I can do a parallel line coming down here. So, I'm just going to show you the parallel line method using a compass. So if I swing anywhere on this line and arc, And anywhere else down here in arc, I'll go down here low. If I draw a parallel, if I draw a tangent to those two arcs, 
that is a parallel line which is I didn't even measure this radius but I know that that's the radius out from there and the radius up from there and that here is my answer that is the center and if I draw this circle it should be touching the ground and touching the back of the net Now, it's looking now for all constructions and points of contact. Okay, so the points of contact anyway, for one thing, one point of contact is straight down because wherever it's sitting, the point of contact is straight down on the ground. So that is one point of contact there, P1. And the other point of contact then is 90 degree angle. So I just set up this angle here. And it has to be a 90 degree angle to that. So now that I have that angle there, I'm gonna just turn my set square. And it's here. In other words, I'm using the 90 degree corner of my set square going through the center like this. So putting the 90 degree angle, so one side's there, the other side's going through the center. And that is the second point of contact. Now, the other way I could have done that is I could have bisected the angle. So if I had that horizontal line with the center, I'll just open up the compass here and I will just bisect the angle, measure out two distances, an arc, another arc. Now we've already answered the question, but I'm just showing you an alternative way. And if I had bisected this angle here, That bisector goes straight through the center as well. So that was another way I could have used to do it. Now question 14 there, it says, the graphic shows three solids, the light is shining on the solids like this. So it's shining downwards from above at an angle. So draw the shadows cast by the other two. So they finished one first and we've got to do the other two. So look, I'm just going to say if that's the angle for the first one, it would be going kind of parallel. So I'm going to just shine the light down sort of parallel to them. So the top of it would be coming down like that angle and From the center, then it's going to be parallel to this roughly. Okay, so that would be kind of the center of it there. And I'm going to just. So that there is the shadow of the apex on the ground. And that's going to be a tangent to here and a tangent to there. So that there would be my shadow on the ground. Just looking to see, I think I have a gray pencil here. But the most important thing in doing this is just to know that it would give you a triangle or it's going to a point. Now a bit similar there then, if this is the angle again of the light shining down. Um, 
This one there now is just more of a guess, I think, really. In that the shadow of the ball coming down here. going to be giving me a shape like this on the ground. That might be coming out a little bit more here. So something like that's not too bad. Now finally then 15, our data representation now, apples is 60. And bananas is 45. So you can see there, 55, 50, 45. So the grid is done in five as we know that now, 45, so 40, 35. 25 15 okay so um now you could number them all maybe i just should 55 50 40 30 20 and 10 okay so the grape is 25 kiwi is 20 Oranges are 40. Pear is 10. Just join them back up to each other. So complete the chart to represent the information. So that's that. Now again, this video is just under an hour, but that's because we're after doing all 15. And I'm kind of going slow and talking my way through the reasoning for it. But when you're doing your junior start exam, you need to answer 10. But really you want to answer 12 or 13, just in case you go wrong on any of them and have a bit of peace of mind. So I hope you enjoy that. See you back for the next lesson.